Thanks for listening to the Rebuild a Seattle Seahawks podcast with me, Rob Staten. Today, I wanted to talk about the possibility of Baker Mayfield joining the Seahawks, the impact of Devontae Adams' trade to the Las Vegas Raiders on DK Metcalf and his future, and a thought on something John Schneider said in yesterday's press conference. Let's start with Mayfield, though. It's been a pretty interesting last couple of days for the Browns and for Baker Mayfield. First of all, it emerged that Cleveland were one of the contenders for Deshaun Watson. Then today, it was revealed that they were not in consideration and the list has been shortened to two. It will be the Atlanta Falcons, it will be the New Orleans Saints, and Watson's going to spend the weekend deciding what his next move is going to be. Mayfield then requested a trade. That request has been rejected, although the feeling is, according to some of the reporters, that the two parties are still expected to part. There's no real coming back from this. And Mayfield, through his representatives or whatever, has let it be known through the media that he sees the Indianapolis Colts and the Seattle Seahawks as an option, which isn't a big surprise if he heard Pete Carroll's somewhat rambling opening gambit in his press conference yesterday where he spoke at length about people getting second chances. Well, this is what it would be for Baker Mayfield. It would be a fantastic second chance. The thought of Mayfield is an interesting one. And we live in a world today where people want instant gratification. You don't want to wait for anything. You want things right here, right now. The Seahawks have begun a rebuild by trading Russell Wilson and cutting Bobby Wagner, their two highest profile players. And rather than wait 12 months and take a couple of drafts and a couple of free agency markets to build this team, If there is a chance to go and make a trade for a quarterback or a key player, there are some fans who want to see that. And we saw that with the Deshaun Watson conversation and we're seeing it now with Baker Mayfield. It would be seen as an exciting move by some and a cause for some optimism because there's a hierarchy with quarterbacks. People are going to be very minimally excited about Drew Locke but they'd still be more excited about Drew Locke than, say, Andy Dalton. Well, Baker Mayfield is ahead of Drew Locke in that hierarchy, and all of them are below Russell Wilson, but that's beside the point. The problem with trading for Mayfield is getting a deal that works for Seattle and for Cleveland. And what the report is tonight, which is from Jacina Anderson, according to her league source, it would be and I'm going to quote the tweet here, perhaps a second rounder for Mayfield or a conditional third rounder that turns into a second. That's a very expensive trade, and I wouldn't be prepared to make that offer. Mayfield only has one year left on a very expensive contract, by the way. It's $18 million for this year. And unless Cleveland are going to absorb some of that, then you'd probably be expected to pay it. If Mayfield plays very well this year, then he's going to have fantastic leverage in negotiations over a contract extension in 12 months. And it may be that you don't want to pay that. Do you want to pay, for example, Baker Mayfield 40 to $45 million from next year onwards because he's played well and you wish to retain him and you spent a pick on him? I would suggest not. But if he doesn't play well, then you aren't going to extend him and you've wasted a draft pick. So if he was on a rookie deal for another couple of years or three years, yeah, do you know what? Taking a chance on a second rounder or a conditional third rounder would make a lot of sense. What amounts to a rental, though, it's very hard to justify spending that much. I think that any kind of deal would have to be a shot to nothing for the Seahawks, a genuine look and see what he's got. And that, to me, would mean a day three pick. But that's a very difficult trade to execute because Cleveland have to come out of this having saved some face. Mayfield is quite a popular player amongst Browns fans. Imagine, for example, if Cleveland traded Baker Mayfield for a fourth round pick to the Seahawks and then turned around and gave a second round pick to the San Francisco 49ers for Jimmy Garoppolo. That could potentially be a GM and coach killer, that kind of trade, if it doesn't work out. You would be taking a huge gamble, and the two players would be compared to each other constantly. 
Garoppolo's had a lot of injuries, so has Mayfield. But what happens coming off shoulder surgery, by the way, if Jimmy Garoppolo is not ready to start the new season or if he gets injured very early in his first season in Cleveland while Baker Mayfield's playing very well in Seattle? That is not a good look, and therefore it makes it an incredible risk for Cleveland. And this is the problem. We've seen a lot of interesting trades, and we're going to talk about one in this podcast. But it's why trades are genuinely difficult to execute, because finding that middle ground between two teams is tricky. Is there a compromise between the two, between what I would assume is this is Cleveland letting everybody know what they would accept through Jacina Anderson, a second rounder or a conditional third? Is there a middle ground between that and what someone would be willing to pay? I'm not sure, but I would like the Silks to approach it this way. I am not totally against Baker Mayfield coming in to play for Seattle. I think it would generate a bit of excitement. It would be interesting, even though I think that Mayfield's upside is pretty limited. His career, even when he has been playing well, uh, hasn't been particularly good. For example, his highest number of touchdown passes in a season is 27 in four years. He's never had a quarterback rating over 100. Yes, he's had some injury issues, but he's also got to play on a team with people like Nick Chubb and a very productive running game, a decent offensive line. He's had good receivers to throw to. So it's not as if he's been in a horrible environment and just hasn't had a chance to succeed. You could argue he should have done a lot better than he did and that the flashes have been few and far between. Now, at the same time, Seattle doesn't have an answer at quarterback and taking a lot of shots on players isn't the worst thing in the world. And if you get a chance to take a, a shot on somebody who was the former number one overall pick, yeah, why not? And, and easily you can justify that as being a better option for the Seahawks. And as Carol was talking about second chances, Mayfield will be a pretty interesting one. But the Seahawks have got to get back to what they've done well in trades. They have been at their best when they've found value and they've taken opportunities. For example, when it became evident that Marshawn Lynch's time was coming to an end in Buffalo, Seattle had to be patient, but they got the deal done at a bargain price, and Marshawn Lynch changed the Seahawks forever. They've had other success, trading for players like Chris Clemens on the cheap, or more recently, Quandre Diggs. Now, these are the kind of deals where Seattle has had a lot of success. When they've gone for these one-year rentals at great expense, more often than not, it hasn't worked. And this, to me, is the kind of situation that when you are starting a rebuild, don't do it. Don't give away your high picks. Spend them instead on young players that you have control over for four years and give them a chance. If Mayfield can come in at the right price, fine. Otherwise, your intention should be to draft a quarterback, have four or five years of club control. And if that quarterback simply isn't available in this draft, then wait until next year. That instant gratification is not going to come in the way of a Super Bowl in 2022. The chances are it will not even come in terms of a playoff appearance this year. That needs to be embraced. And while Carroll can talk about his desire to be very competitive this year and to never have the mindset of not being competitive, well, there's a difference between having the mindset and actually believing what is realistic. And the Seahawks need a dose of realism here. If they're not going to say it publicly, they need to accept it privately. This is probably a two-draft process at least. But if they do a good job in the draft and if they use their picks in the right areas on the right players and they develop those players and they complement it with good work in the free agent market, yeah, do you know what? Within two off-seasons, you can be a contender. Just ask the Cincinnati Bengals. So for me, be patient. If the Mayfield trade comes to you, then fine. Cleveland doesn't have a lot of leverage if that relationship is broken. Use that to your advantage. Be prepared to wait on it if you want to, if you want to do this deal. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. Do not spend a second round pick or a conditional third on Baker Mayfield. The big news in the NFL 
today is the Devontae Adams trade, which nobody saw coming, but apparently has been brewing for some time. He has supposedly informed the team he wouldn't play on the franchise tag. He was tagged. Apparently, Aaron Rodgers agreed to his new contract, fully in the knowledge that Devontae Adams was not going to be there, which is a surprise. When I heard that news, I'm shocked that he didn't end up in Denver after all of this. Because the Packers now, yeah, they've got a couple of good running backs. They've got an okay offensive line. Don't have a lot in terms of weapons. They have two first-round picks, and maybe they will use those to add young talent in this receiver class. And once again, it is a very, very loaded receiver class. But it's surprising. And the AFC West is becoming a supercharged division, which is going to be must-see television next year. What I want to talk about, though, is the impact on DK Metcalf, because Devontae Adams' salary is now worth an average of over $28 million. In fact, it's $28.25 million. He's gone to the Raiders, and they've given him a contract to make him the highest-paid receiver in the league, topping DeAndre Hopkins' $27.25 million. I think teams are going to be incredibly worried about the direction of this, this receiver market's going. We've seen Christian Kirk get an average salary of $18 million a year, which was more than anybody expected. A year ago, Kenny Golladay got $18 million a year. Players like Mike Williams are on $20 million. Chris Godwin, $20 million. Mari Cooper's existing contract's $20 million. Keenan Allen's is $20 million. The Hopkins and, and Adams deals, look, both really good players, are they worth that much? I'm not convinced. And if you are looking to extend a young receiver, either this offseason or next, you're looking at this market and thinking, I don't want any, anything to do with this. Because if you go to a player like DK Metcalf right now, he's going to tell you he's better than Christian Kirk and Kenny Galladay. So he, he's not in the $18 million a year range, which is where you probably would be quite comfortable paying him. He's going to say that he's perhaps better than Mike Williams, that he's got the potential to be better than Chris Godwin, that he's a, a rising talent and perhaps Murray Cooper's a declining one, that he's currently better than Keenan Allen and maybe even better than DeAndre Hopkins because he plays a lot more football than Hopkins does. Devontae Adams is a clear number one receiver in the NFL. That's a different subject. But DK Metcalf may, might say, I want DeAndre Hopkins money or I want $26 million a year or $25 million a year. And there are going to be other receivers who potentially get paid between now and then, like A.J. Brown, who could also reset the market again. Who knows what's going to happen over the next 12 months? But teams are going to look at this with a, and they're going to have a huge headache. How do you pay your young receivers in this market right now? I think that the Devontae Adams contract is probably a tipping point, even if the salary cap rises. Once the top receiver in the league gets a ridiculous salary, it, you know, it's, it's easy for teams to say, well, we can't go beyond that because you're not Devontae Adams. So as long as Devontae Adams continues to produce, it's not too much of an issue in terms of going beyond $28.2 million. But it's how you settle in behind him. And because there is somebody in DeAndre Hopkins who's very close to him, you, know, you can sort of say, well, that's your sort of negotiating point. How do you compare to DeAndre Hopkins, who's coming towards the end of his career? And I think DK Metcalf will easily be well within his rights to ask for 25 or $26 million a year. So you could say, well, if the Seahawks don't want to pay that, just as they didn't want to pay Frank Clark, just as they didn't want to pay Russell Wilson or couldn't pay Russell Wilson another contract, they will inevitably move on. I think that's probably a fair assertion to make, unless they genuinely are willing to pay him $20-odd million a year. The problem is, is if you go to talk to teams, knowing that DK Metcalf's only got one year left on his contract, what if they're not prepared to pay him $25 million a year? Why would the Packers not be prepared to pay Devontae Adams the salary he has now, but then pay DK Metcalf $3 million less? That doesn't make any sense. Now, there may be teams who are willing to pay this money, who've got rookie quarterbacks. You know, A good example of that is perhaps the New York Jets. They really need to get Zach Wilson a huge weapon. They have draft stock. They have cap space. Maybe they could afford to do it in order to give their young quarterback the best chance to succeed. But these other teams, you know, the Packers, for example, they just don't make any sense to, to sort of not pay Adams and then pay Metcalf. So 
making a deal could be particularly difficult. And Devontae Adams has only brought in a first and a second round pick. You know, I would have thought at least DK Metcalf, given his age, would be worth a Jamal Adams type uh, return. But if Devontae Adams only gets you a first and a second, you're only getting a first and a second. And if you only get a first and a second back for DK Metcalf and you have to replace him, that becomes very, very difficult. So I would prefer to keep hold of him. However, I also don't want to pay him $25 million a year. So the Devontae Adams contract and the Christian Kirk contract and the Mike Williams contract and all these other contracts that have been happening with the receivers are just making life very, very difficult for general managers. And I fear what is going to happen with DK Metcalf. I don't think he's going to get traded this offseason unless he pushes for it. Maybe he would. Some people are saying, why don't the Packers package their picks and go after DK Metcalf? It's an interesting thought. I think given the savings that they're making, I think they're probably going to look to the draft instead. And have probably consulted Aaron Rodgers with that. But who knows? Who knows what's going to happen there? I think the Seahawks have, are done getting rid of players now and they're trying to build, frankly. So I don't think it happens this year. It may not even happen next year. They may franchise him and just keep him on the franchise tag and then decide to trade him in a year's time after that. Who knows? They've got some options there. It'll really come down to how much DK Metcalf wants to push this. And I think after Russell Wilson, he will probably be considering his options. What does he want to do? Does he want to go somewhere with a proven, legit quarterback? Does he want to give Seattle a year to see if they can find one? It's hard to see. say. One thing that Metcalf will remember is that the Silks are the ones who drafted him as he was falling and they traded up for him. And he said in the past that he wants to stay there. Why would he want to go anywhere else? Because I think he's words. And um, I think he sounded genuine when he said that. So we'll see what happens, but it is interesting. The final thing I want to talk about is also interesting. It was John Schneider's comments at the end of the press conference yesterday. Schneider was asked about his views on the quarterback draft class. And as he was answering, he was kind of cut off by Pete Carroll. And Schneider appeared to be quite agitated by that and wanted to answer his question. So when the press conference was wrapping up and Carroll was actually, you know, taking his papers and getting ready to leave the, the, the table they were sat at, Schneider stopped him in his tracks and said, I'm just going to finish my question. I'm fine finishing my answer on that. And finished answering the question about quarterback class. And I think he said, if memory serves, that essentially they hadn't done a good enough job adding quarterbacks over the years. That was something that he said, you know, that's what they did in Green Bay. That's what he anticipated doing, was taking a lot of quarterbacks, always looking for the next guy. They, they intended to do that, and they haven't done a good enough job there. And that's true. They've drafted two quarterbacks since 2010. He also said, and this was a really interesting point, that while we all focus on quarterbacks in the media, I say we, the media generally focuses on quarterbacks at the top of the draft, the guys who are going to potentially go in the first round or even the second round. And he said that, you know, Russell Wilson was a third round pick and Tom Brady was a sixth round pick. And you're not always necessarily just looking for that guy at the top of the first round. I found that really interesting. Not that it necessarily means anything. I don't think Schneider was there being very generous to the media and saying, I'm just going to reveal our draft approach. But it, it did make me think. It made me think a couple of things, actually. Does his view that they have not taken enough quarterbacks over the years mean that they could potentially, let's say, take two this year? Washington famously traded up for Robert the Griffin III in uh, Robert Griffin III, not Robert the Griffin III, in 2012 at great expense. And then they added Kirk Cousins in round four. Could Seattle potentially take a quarterback in round one or round two and take another one in round four or five or six? Because you've got to take a lot of shots when you're looking for a franchise quarterback. And if there are two guys that they rate quite well, they may well do that and just have an open competition with Drew Locke, with Jacob Eason, with Geno Smith, with whoever's there. I wouldn't rule that out. Or could they possibly do what I hope they do which is acknowledge that this isn't a great draft class. Yes, there are players with traits, such as Malik Willis and Matt Corral, who are very, very interesting players and could be great players, but there's a lot of question marks there. Do you just accept the situation that you have been presented with this draft class? Try and get the best player possible at number nine. Try and add foundational pieces at 9, 40, and 41. Accept your fate build up your lines, add a linebacker in round two, address whatever positions you want to address. Accept that this isn't going to be a one-year fix. 
and look at day two and day three players, so round three onwards, who could be an option for you. And the players that I think are very interesting here that could tick a few boxes are Jack Cohen at Notre Dame, who's got a good arm. No one would accuse him of being fleet of foot or a scrambler or an improviser, but he's also not a terrible mover. He has been able to escape pressure. He can throw on the run. I think if you watch his highlights, there's a lot of potential there. The other name to mention is Caleb Ellaby at Western Michigan. Again, a player who never really delivered fully on his potential, but they will have scouted him when they were watching the Eskridge, when he showed his best football. And a few teams, I think, are going to view him a lot higher than the media, and he could be a fourth or fifth round pick. And the same for Jack Cohen. It's just something to consider. And I would be much more comfortable with that. Not because I think Cohen's going to be an elite player. Not because I think Ellaby is the second coming of Russell Wilson. but if you're going to take chances, and I think the difference between those two players and some of the guys that are going to go much earlier is that great. And if you can go and get a great pass rusher and a linebacker and whatever in those early picks and then take a chance on a young quarterback a little bit later on with no risk, with no gamble, and if it doesn't work, well, next year, you've got another chance to have another try. That would be the approach for me. Whether the Seahawks are willing to do that, I'm not sure. I think John Schneider might be. Pete Carroll seems a lot more intense on putting together a team that can succeed. But then Pete Carroll thought that with Tavares Jackson at quarterback. So who knows? He will think that they can contend with whoever is behind center or under center. So we'll see. But I think it's an interesting point that Schneider made. And the fact that he returned to that at the end of the press conference and was intent on saying it, I find very interesting. For more conversations like this, plus special guests, got a good one coming up very soon. An analysis on everything to do with the Seahawks during this very crucial offseason. Subscribe to the Rebuild podcast, which is now available on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Until next time, bye for now.